<laughs> had to get the trade out. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> everybody, welcome to the Devin Hour podcast. My name is Devin, aka Devin Two Woke, and I'm so excited to have this very, very special guest on to the Devin Hour. Somebody who I have been watching for such a long time. I just said mm-hmm. that they practically have raised me, and I'm just so. <laughs> I'm just I am, so happy that I am not Nicki Minaj. I do not have no sons. No, <laughs> I don't stand none of these people, child. I don't. I've already said. I've already told you. I don't. Well, everybody, I don't stand anybody like that. Yeah, I had to give I that don't. up. 2020 told me, you know, fuck these celebrities. We are retiring. Did these celebrities show up? Like, these celebrities have been showing all the way out. Oh, year. my gosh. It's, but it's not surprising because that has been their, like, that has been their theme the whole yeah. time. So it was just now that we're hyper-focused on people, are li- everyone is affected and about what's going on. It's just like, sis, calm down. Like, right now is not the time to talk about you spending $300,000 on the watch or buying a $200,000 car. Exactly, like, exactly. That's been their appeal. The whole entire yeah. time. But now that we are in this pandemic and everybody's broke, <laughs> and it's just like, you're not appealing no more. <laughs> like, no. we don't have our regular jobs and our regular routines to distract us from your nonsense. Now your nonsense mm-hmm. is in our faces whenever we pop up on Instagram. And it's just so ridiculous to me that you are out here flaunting the shit that you have, but also still performing during a pandemic, opening up an OnlyFans account. Like, Y'all don't have to fake the funk. Like, we're all struggling, so you could just admit it. Like, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> yes. And I'm, I've been, I actually, when I did a video talking about that, I didn't expect that video to get that much traction. But yeah, it did. It, it did. It did. Like, I think it's at 100 and something thousand views. And it was just me just talking about, and I, it wasn't me trying to stay on like female artists, because a lot of male artists that do that. But yeah. I don't really listen to male artists like that. And right. I know they are here doing. Um, club appearances and stuff too, but I'm just I'm not. There's we, we don't real. follow I'm, them. We don't. I just don't know what's going on with them. I just don't. And these are the folks I'm giving my money, my time, my like everything too. So I know what's going on from the like the folks who are starting up, the ones who are like in the middle, and the ones who are claiming to be at the top. So when I'm, was it? It wasn't Dream Doll. Was it Dream Doll? Or was it M- was, Mulatto? It was Mulatto. Yeah, Big Lotto. It was her. And she got called out because she was out here, uh, you know, doing these club appearances. And then when she said, oh, well, girl, I got to work. I'm an essential worker. The same you essential work you out here throwing thousands of dollars out in the air. And, right. And so which one is it? Because I don't be throwing thousands of dollars out like that. I'm just picking the dollars up. I'm picking the, the shit plan. up. Right. There's... <laughs> It's so ridiculous that these celebrities just, they just really showed their ass throughout this year. So that caused me to be like, okay, I'm not standing for nobody. All right. Mm -hmm. Cause none of y'all are benefiting me. None of y'all are paying my bills. Number one. Also, it's like, you have a social responsibility in that you are neglecting and Mm -hmm. it's it's just, I can't deal. So I was like, fuck it. I'm going to just listen to Mariah and that's it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's it you know you she ready for the christmas album the christmas <laughs> the re-release of the re-release of the re-release yes, yes i am okay. i'm not a big fan of christmas music like that though i'm not either it's just, it's just her <laughs> oh okay okay well uh, i i like mariah carey once in a while but yeah yeah i mean it's fine i'm like this girl she she ain't redistributing her wealth so i'm just kind of uninterested when yeah, it comes to all <laughs> But I think, I think, like, I like Mariah sometimes. And I think that's with everybody. But I think yeah. sometimes I see Mariah, she be doing the most, but everybody loves it. But I just, it, it does the opposite for me. I'd be like, ah, this, is, <laughs> this ain't me. But I love the energy that she has online. And On the grand people. scheme of things, she's not as problematic as others. So we're Yeah, just- I think she, I think, I definitely think she has some, like, probably some questionable politics, but I think she knows yeah. not to say stuff. And Which- I'm okay with celebrities doing that. She's like, Hey, Christmas time, Christmas cheer. And it's just like, okay, girl. Like, we just dance along um, versus her coming out and saying, you know, well, maybe if folks who get EBT, maybe they can only just be able to buy healthy food. And right. Like, saying stuff like that. Now it's like, the Christmas music has started, stopped 
and now the Halloween music is about right. to start like, we're, get you we're not asking these celebrities to give us their opinion. It's probably share a link. <laughs> you know what I mean? Repost something. But we don't really <laughs> care about what you have to say or your opinions, child. We just want the music or the entertainment factor and just keep it pushing. If you have, if you know, for, you know when your opinion is a trash ass opinion, like, you know. They do, they do, they do, they do. And a lot of them um, have been doing that. And it's been, like I said earlier, like it's been having us pay attention to, hey, bro, this is actually not okay. Right. Considering that the people who are like working class folk um, are out here keeping you rich and keeping you fed and all these things, because without us, you would not be able to do it any of these things that you're bragging about. So it's just like, girl, exactly. figure that out. <laughs> there you go. That's a good little inter- little warm up. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we love an appetizer. <laughs> so I really want to get into your background because I'm really interested to know about the, the humble beginnings of the King of Reeds. Okay. So, let's, <laughs> so where did you grow up and how would you describe young Justin? Um, I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I'm born and raised there all of my life. I moved to Atlanta in August. Well, no, it was July. It was the middle of July um, to Atlanta. And it was a road that I did not expect to happen like that. Um, but I think, yeah, around that time, I'm still calling myself um, Justin J. Like, mm-hmm. everybody was calling me Justin J. And then my, I think my YouTube name was still Justin J. 1232. Yeah. And honestly, that name was about um, like something like it was just a name that somebody gave me. Like when you know you create a new account, it's like since your name is Justin James, we're gonna give you these random numbers. Right, right. <laughs> so that's what it was. That was my name on AOL. <laughs> so yes, exactly. So that was like years ago. That was like what twenty years ago or something. So um, that's where Justin James came from. Um, and honestly, someone, I can't remember who it was, but a long time ago, someone had called me, she said, Charles, you're just a king of reeds. And they just commented that I was like, okay, this is really cute. So it just got traction and stuff. I was like, okay, like, I'm gonna do the shift to calling myself the king of reeds. Now, to the humble staff, I think I've always, you know, maintained some type of uh, what people would describe as humbleness. I actually hate the word humble. Mm-hmm. But I think people misuse it and they seem to want to use that when somebody is like getting a little bit more recognition and they're right. starting to like pop and it's just like, okay, well, slow down because you might lose that, which is true, which is also true. I might not lose it. It might just continuously grow. Mm-hmm. But I feel like folks do that. It's like the beginning stage of like being a little bit jealous, a little bit hating and stuff. But I've never been one of those people to be like braggadocious and all those things. Like that's just not me. Um, I just don't believe in it. Like I just don't believe in in talking about all of the things, um, all the financial things that right. are going on. Because I know what it's like, and I don't want people to feel like, oh, dude, you work hard. You know, everything's going to be fine. Just work right, hard. Right. It's not always true. And I'm more focused on living in a world where people don't have to work two, three jobs driving Postmates. Postmate, to survive. Degrees. Yeah, just to be able to just survive, not even to be able to buy like these expensive things, but just to survive. So um, yeah, it's been, it's been a long, long process. A lot of people know my story. Um, like the, you know, from the, <laughs> from the, the what would the government what would say? From the park bench to Buckhead was the <laughs> thing that folks were like, laughing at because um there was some time where i did not i didn't have um housing i right. was going through an issue of like finding uh apartment to approve me with an eviction on my record on my public record and um then they just to get stable housing like housing in atlanta is expensive i know folks joke like kate michelle and say you, <laughs> you don't need no roommate but that's outside of atlanta yeah but atlanta is kind of um it is a little bit expensive so like, I understand the struggle. I don't think that was something that would ever, like, leave me because I think I also have, like, PTSD because even as I, like, grow and uh, things are becoming better, I'm still nervous about things going away. Like, right. I, I like that. Like, it still scares me. Like, child, I don't like to wait till the first to pay my rent. Not no more. I want to pay it before because I'm so nervous that something might happen. Mm-hmm. That I might not, and I don't want anybody to have that type of stress with you know not being able to pay 
their rent and then have to worry about getting put out. That is the worst feeling in the world. Scary. It's so scary. It is. Because it's also interesting how, how it works that you need a shelter. Like they say that you need a shelter, you need all this, but yet you have to come out of your, your pocket so much money just to be able to live and have somewhat, have some stability. Like, but it's supposed to be a required mm-hmm. thing. So it's like, what? Like, it's, it's ridiculous. But yeah, I felt mm-hmm. that. And then Definitely. We- when you think about all the things that goes into it, just I was telling my friend the other day, like no one should have like eviction should even be a thing, let alone no. you being on your record for no seven years. Um, because in the time that I did get that, like I've made way more money since then. But apartments would look at me. It's it's another race thing, you know. They like they run it through the system, and the system says, oh, if you've had this with this type of credit score and this, you're more likely to. Um, you know, not pay your rent or go through the same thing. But what it really is dealing is kind of weeding out like black and brown folks. Oh my like, gosh. Yes. I said that so many times within the last couple of years that eviction is just so anti black. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, because that's it's a part of the system. That, yeah, that's something that my friends have have definitely have to deal with. And I'm just like, it's mm-hmm. crazy how you know with well, I, how I feel like with white people, they get a little bit more leeway with everything. Like they just get just a little bit more, but when Black people do something is always so heavy. Is our credit as it is as a community is just not the best. So for you to do that mm-hmm. shit, also on top of all that, knowing that black people are like honestly really being affected negatively and systematically oppressed, like that is so fucked up. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so fucked up. So I understand. I don't, they know that. They know that. So they just try to look at. They try to look at. They trying to find ways to kind of. Oh, we're not saying we're not being racist. It's just the system. It's just uh, it's it's out of my hands. It's above me now, but it, yeah, I'm sure it is. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, I definitely felt that, especially up here. In, I'm in New Jersey. I'm in Jersey City. Um, I was just okay. outside, just outside of New York City. So I know what it is to like have to come out of your pocket and pay so much money just for something. <laughs> you know, just for a space. Yeah. I've heard about, I've heard about, I've not been to New York that many times, but I've heard enough about it to like, it's a lot. It's a lot. So folks are like, if y'all think y'all got a bed in Atlanta, New York is a whole, like up north is a whole different thing. I have never been to Atlanta. Like I haven't been inside the city. I've been outside like College Park and Mm -hmm. all out there, but I haven't been inside the city. So how would you describe Atlanta? Uh, I would think that... I would kind of describe Atlanta is well. I've been here five years, so it's and I'm just now really starting to get to the point where I'm going different places and things. I still don't know my way around Atlanta. I don't probably think I ever will because as long as I have my phone, I'm not. I don't need to remember. I can remember some stuff, but the moment I get into a neighborhood, I'm like, "Here, take me home," because I don't know where the hell I'm at. But I would describe Atlanta as like is peak gentrification. Like you're really starting to see it a lot. Like it is. Thriving, people say it's thriving, but thriving for who? Is it thriving for the folks who built this city, for black folks who built this city, or is it like for the people who, oh girl, I've been able, I can I can see this city doing something for me, let me move it to here and um, save a little money. Because you got people, like right now with uh, a lot of folks working from home, you do have some folks from, um, from New York who are working at Google and all these other places. Yeah. Now I'm saying I can just move to Atlanta or a city and save some money instead of like I don't have to go to the office. Like I don't need to stay in California to be where I can go to another city and save some money. So I think it is thriving for those people. And you kind of see it. That's like another luxury apartment being built every other month or every other week. And then you have a huge um, housing problem in Atlanta. So as much as we try to say Atlanta is really fun and it's cute, it, like Atlanta is not doing the best for like black and brown folks. And I, I love the city. I love the city. Um, it's done a lot for me, but I do have a lot of questions about the, the folks who have been um, like the boot uh, on their neck. Yeah, so, I um, felt that. I felt that. Mm-hmm. Up here is the same. It's the same issue. Jersey City has always been a city that. Uh, been the sanctuary for black and brown people for Mm -hmm. years and then now people are looking at us like oh new york city's too expensive so we're going to come over here there's been so many different uh these big old fucking buildings filled with like condos being built recently um a, a community here that's been here for a long long time is now the community came together so they could redevelop it and now it's going to become 
a school plus housing, which I'm just like, that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. So it's fucking ridiculous. So now we have a big housing crisis over here and it's just so, it's so ridiculous. People are leaving, like they're leaving, going like Florida and shit. <laughs> like, it's so crazy. But yeah, felt that same same over here in Jersey. State. Okay, wow. I, I've not been to. I think I've been in Jersey one time, and I recorded an episode with the Grapevine. But it was snowing so bad, girl. Y'all be having snow up there. We got there. I think it was like it was snowing a little bit, and then it was just like calming down. I said, "Are we gonna make it the hell out of here?" <laughs> no, like sometimes it gets as bad as like Chicago out here. Like it gets so bad. Yeah, I'd actually like to see some snow right now, though. I I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> you said no. <laughs> I really hope not. <laughs> so when you were coming up, was your goal always to do like entertainment? Was always to to spread the good word, <laughs> be woke? What was your What was your idea? What was your ideal career growing up? Um, it's going to be very problematic. But honestly, um, I've met some people made jokes and said that I should be um. I should do like comedy or something. Like I was like, girl, I have social anxiety. I'm not doing <laughs> stand up comedy. It's yeah, not giving me. And then at that time, you had like, sh- like stuff like Kings of Comedy. I was like, that world doesn't exist for no queer person. Like Hell getting in front of a whole bunch of cis hetero folks and telling knock knock jokes, and they'd be mm-hmm. like, it's a it's the door. <laughs> like I just I I couldn't see myself doing that. But um. People really, like, I really wanted to be a police officer. I wanted to be, yes, I went to school for criminal justice. And I wanted to be a police officer or a sheriff because I was anti-black as hell. And I felt like, well, maybe if I become a police officer, I could be able to talk to black folks on the streets and tell them to stop doing things. And da, da, da. Like, <laughs> I, really, I was like, I'm gonna make a difference in the community. And I, and I really believed that shit. I really believed that at that time. Um, but I started doing YouTube videos, um, just com- like just complaining about things, and it got a lot of attention from folks. It's okay. Let me do more like reality show reviews. Got into Love and Hip Hop. Yes, I got remember. Into Housewa- yeah, I got into uh, Real Housewives of Atlanta, and I just started doing like that. And I started to do more also of those uh, videos of just like takes of things that were going on, like pop culture stuff. And when we started to see um, a lot of protests around Trayvon Martin and everything, I was in the army. I was in the army around that time, so my anti-blackness had started to like rear its ugly head, and people were seeing the things that I was saying. It's like eh, I don't know about this one. So as as I was having conversations about things, people were responding. Some people were agreeing with the anti-black stuff I was saying, but some folks were like, no, this ain't it, bitch. We need to do some reading. So doing that and it was just not even just that it was even hiv too like there were several things like i i'm proud the community for like telling me like hey girl this ain't it this ain't the tea i don't know what you're doing like your platform is too big for you to be out here and then my platform, i didn't even have any subscribers at the time i think i was like it's probably like 10 or twenty thousand or something <laughs> but it's like girl you got to do a better job i guess they seen something in me and just like you got to do a better job so in that, I started to unpack, and it was a lot of unpacking because I hated cis federal black men. I could not stand the ass. They tortured me throughout my elementary school, like throughout elementary school, through middle school, through high school. And I just always felt uncomfortable around them because I got bullied for being queer, yeah. bullied for being feminine, just bullied for being just, just different. Before I even knew what like gay was, they was already saying stuff. So it was like, I don't know what this is like, but I knew I had attraction to the same sex, but I didn't know what like gay and everything meant. Right, like so right. young on so young when I was young. So I had to unpack that. And there's still some work in progress because when I went, um, I was at the red light the other day. Um, me and my friend was on our way to have brunch and we had stopped at the red light. Mm-hmm. And the guys came out trying, like these teenagers came out trying to sell like Gatorade and water and all that other stuff. Right, right. And I got, I got uncomfortable. Like I got, it, like it was like me feeling like walking down in high school, walking down the halls, and somebody say a faggot or whatever, like sweet or something like that. So I got a little bit uncomfortable. They 
started knocking on the door trying to, you know, aggressive, like, hey, buy something. I was like, I'm not, we didn't say anything. I didn't let my window down. One, because it's Corona, and y'all ain't got no mask on. So <laughs> okay. I'm like, I, I'm like, y'all ain't got no mask on. It's giving too much. I don't want no gas red. I don't want no water. I just came here to just drive down the light. That's all I want. So he peeped in because my windows was really dark. And then it's probably me because my car is technically a little trade car. So uh-huh. maybe I thought I was something good you know, or something or whatever. But then they looked through the bubble windshield. They saw oh, these two faggots be trying to and they said, well, fuck you, faggot. And I'm just like, God damn. Like, that's because I didn't yeah. want to buy no Gatorade, no hot ass Gatorade. <laughs> so, like, that still left me. Like, I was so, I felt so in my feelings and so distraught that I wanted to, like, I really wanted to call the police. Like, I really, but I was like, Justin, has any harm been done to you worth you getting, like, the police involved? Like, you are offended by them saying this, but what if the police come and something happens? Right. Was it worth that? And I, that's why I had to check myself. So it's still some work. It's still some work inside of myself. Like, I, I'm not going to say I was not in any danger, but it wasn't a danger enough. Well, it's not even if the dangerous situation was just like, I know the police are dangerous. Mm-hmm. So even though these folks are saying these things, the police are more dangerous than these folks who are here that dealing with now because right. I know the chances of them doing something and I don't want to give them that power. So it's still some work, like, and I'll be trying to tell folks, like, there is not no one, like, oh, girl, I got it. I was like, I know everything. It's always just unpacking it because we live in a, we live in this world. Right. Like, we would live in white supremacist capitalist world. We, we are fighting to live and survive in all of these things. So some of these ideas that we have in our heads are, are not helpful to us, to, to our community. And we have to like unpack that. So that was me doing the work internally, even though I did not want to. I wanted to be, I'm like, I want to get these folks back for the, the trauma and shit I experienced <laughs> when I was a child. Like, I want to get back. And I'm just like, what is that going to do for us? Right. What is that going to do for us? It's a, it's some work though, child. I hate to hear I felt every single ounce of that sentiment because I just recently got out of college this year, okay. and I I still feel a way about cishet people in general. It's particularly black cishet men because that's where a lot of like a lot of the trauma of me mm-hmm. growing up. That's where that comes from. So I, there's still a lot of checking too for me because some because you can't. I can't be mad at people that are ignorant. Like, you know what I mean? I can't stay mad at them because they just need to know, they need to know better. You Mm -hmm. know, I can't do nothing about that. So I'm just still a lot of unpacking there for me as well. So I completely understand a lot of that sentiment. But Justin, the shit that you got into on YouTube. A lot of shit. Hold on now, which one? Are you talking about the shit on YouTube or are you talking about the shit on Twitter? Which type of shit we talking about? Oh, we're getting on, we're going to get to Twitter in a minute. But YouTube? Oh my God. So like I said, I've been watching you for a long time. I've been watching you since I was in high school. So I'm, I'm 22. Oh my God. I thought you was like at least about 25 or something. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so that means that you were watching me while I've been on YouTube for like, I think about nine years or something, I think. Now, yeah. I started like 2000 and when I got back from um, overseas and I was in Ormond. So that was like 2011. I started kind of doing full time 2012. Yeah. So I, um, yeah. So I started watching you in 2012. So I was like a eighth grade freshman in high school. Oh my God. Yeah. So I was watching you, the Scorpion show. Like this is, this will be my routine. Scorpion show. The King- yes. Justin J. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Kingsley. Like, okay. because that was the only place where I got to see people who just, who were just like me and also people who kind of had similar thoughts and processes when it comes to pop culture. Because in middle school, I was the only one who was really into pop culture, into divas, into uh, discussing LGBTQ topics. I was the only one I was openly out at the time when I was like 12. Okay, that's, that's how I was too when I was like in the ninth grade. Yeah, like everybody fucking knew. <laughs> at this point, I, at that point, I couldn't do shit about it. I was like, you know, I done been harassed, I done been bullied. Mm-hmm. So at this point, I was like, either you're gonna take it or leave it, and mm-hmm. there's that. But watching you guys really became important to me, an important part of my life because it was my first ounce of representation. Um, mm. We didn't get to see that on television, or at least not in a positive light. Okay, I guess. We'll, yeah. 
and there was only like one or two shows I was on. What was the show called? Um, what was on Logo? What was it called? It was Black. Oh, uh, you talked about um, Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark. Yeah, I didn't grow up on Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark was honestly supposed to be giving me black. Noah's Ark. By the time Noah's Ark came out, I was like nineteen, so it didn't do anything for me. And it, to me, it wasn't realistic. It wasn't realistic to oh, me at no. all. Like it just, it wasn't. It wasn't like a lot of folks were like, ah. so I grew up watching Chris Folk. So I was like 14, 15 years old when Chris Folk came out. So I was, even though it was all white, peaked me everywhere. I wasn't interested in that. But just seeing, just, just seeing gay men have sex on HBO was like, <laughs> oh my God, like they is in here humping in the bathhouses and, and I'm doing all these things. I'm just like, oh my God. I knew that this was a world that I would never see because I was like, I don't, I wasn't watching because you know, they were white and gay. I was just watching because they were gay. Right. So that's like, so by the time Noah's Ark came out, I was just, girl, this shit is fat phobic. I don't want to watch this shit. <laughs> and people say, how is it fat phobic? Because Russell ain't had a life scene. And I'm just like, it's not realistic. Like y'all are not really talking about the real issues. Y'all just, Oh, we gonna give the fat, dark skin guy a light skin, desirable man, and fat phobia is over, girl. What are you talking about? But it's like the show ain't even y'all don't even give her no character to, other than being the. the um, joke Do you remember the the, um, the reunion they did early this year? I didn't watch it. I didn't either. People were going up for it, and I was like, "This show's fucking trash. <laughs> like, why are y'all going up for this damn show like that?" <laughs> Like, because it's all they had. It's, it's all, all they, they had. had. <laughs> I think I think I was the only one in that cluster that was just like, oh dear, this shit is trash out. I <laughs> Yeah, it's very much what is this, honey? <laughs> it just didn't do nothing for me. It doesn't it do anything do for anybody now. Okay. So right, it doesn't. Which is why it's probably not on the air right now. Well, okay. Yeah. And you know what? Uh, Patrick Ian Polk, I think, is the person who is old like and I like Patrick Ian Polk. He's, he's done some good work in the community. I, I, I like him. He does, But I yeah. think Pat, Patrick needs to, like, Patrick was dealing with some issues with um, colorism within himself because he always gave, like, the leading role to a light-skinned person. At this point, who isn't dealing with colorism, child? <laughs> well, that's, that's what I'm saying. It's like, I'm, I need, mean, like, Blackbird was another one of his productions. And then also... Um, the show that he had did with um Jesse Jesse Smollett, the movie uh, this, he did with the that. skinny, the skinny, the skinny, yeah, it was just it was the same thing. Um, and then there's a rumor going around that him and Patrick was in a relationship. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know. Yeah, not that's that, another uh, topic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I just I wanted, and I was like, I can see him struggling with that because Patrick is a dark skin, you know, guy. So I'm just like, are you trying to live throughout these light skin characters? Right, right. Yeah, and I want I want to see some fat folks be the, like the lead characters of the show. I don't want us to be the nigga cooking the food and making it. But I don't want to be Big Mama. I don't want to see us bring y'all together and love like uh, be a caretaker. I guess all y'all do is make fat folks caretakers everywhere. Like I I even remember specifically um, when I used when I was on Tinder and I was on like some of the apps. Like some guy, oh, I love your person. I love all these things. You love the idea of me. I want. I would like for you to be attracted to my body and everything else. Stop telling me that my personality is beautiful. I'm not looking for no damn friends. <laughs> You're not going to be. I'm not like. I'm not looking for that. And some folks, they will use you for that. Like they yes. use that folks for that. Like, oh, I just used to like a good person. Why you just want me to make you laugh and all of these things? A bitch is tired of making you laugh. Right. I'm tired. I'm tired of being your damn mama. I'm, <laughs> Grandmama. <laughs> grandma. I'm so I'm tired. I'm tired. Felt that. Yeah, but yeah, like that representation for me growing up, though, all you guys were just so were great. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. every single person at at least at the time. Were, <laughs> <laughs> but what's funny is, no shade, I slick predicted this was going to happen like a while back. I slick predicted this. I was just like, some of this stuff y'all doing is not it's not sustainable over time. Yeah. Um, I, and some of y'all really wasn't like y'all didn't like black folk. <laughs> y'all <think. laughs> but we all grow and we all do those things, but them girls was at my neck at one time. Uh so Oh, I like, remember so, that. <laughs> some of this stuff was justified, some of the things were necessary. But some of the stuff I was like, girl, I, I see this as y'all like a little bit jealous. Because another fat YouTuber at the time of who I really did like, um, 
was told that he didn't see it from me from the beginning. Like he never saw it from me uh, and would just do all types of stuff. And I think I was really hurt. I haven't talked about this much, but I was really hurt when they started to be fat phobic towards me. And they started with those jokes of me being funky. And I was like, you out here making jokes and laughing about me and they're going to do the same shit to you. And girl, you are bigger than me. And like, it, it, it was no, it was no shame. It was just like, I hate, I, it's, it's very anti-black and it is fat phobic to assume that a fat person automatically is funky or stink or some shit. Like that shit was like, that shit was garbage. And it really, really, really got to me. And I was like, I had to, like, I had to realize that this is not coming like they're like this problem and the work that I'm working against and trying to fix. So I, I stopped taking it personally. I said, this, it's not even about me. It's the stuff that they've been taught and the things that they're trying to carry on. Right. Uh, and I'm just like, girl, you got to find a way out of it. You got to find a way out. I was like, girl, the time that you met me, girl, you know damn well I was not funky, girl. You wanted to eat my booty. Don't do that. <laughs> no, don't do that. Right. But, but I think the majority of it was the girls really didn't see it for me because I was, um, I wasn't a conventional like creator, the YouTuber. The you like, stood was... out. You really, <laughs> really stood out. And I think what really made you last the test of time was because of the constant growth. You know, I feel like a lot of people, they kind of stuck stagnant in where they were at. Uh, some still very still stagnant in where they are at. <laughs> As you continue to grow and you really started to, to speak on issues that are really affecting the community and i feel like that's why you gained such a i would say you gained such a loyal and a very niche following while others were kind of chasing the the big you know mm -hmm. the white youtubers were trying to do but you were yes. very into your niche and i think that's what really worked out for you and others too um i'll say definitely like kid fury he's another one who stuck to that niche oh yes yes like kid yeah. fury didn't kid fury didn't change over time like kid fury just like kind of perfected his craft throughout the time he stayed the kid same fury person <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kippy was not trying to be a white YouTuber. He was not trying. And you saw some, and it's easy. And there's some things that I've told YouTube about, like how hard it is to get into the algorithm, how hard it is to get attention, because it's hard for black creators. Once, as soon as they see you, they're like, oh, girl, this black, this ain't got nothing to do with me. And then, bitch, I'm fat and dark skinned. So just like, oh my God, girl, like, give me a light skinned, thin YouTuber and look at it. Like, look, when you look at all the popular black creators throughout YouTube, a lot of them do not talk about anything like any black stuff. It's just like black don't exist. I'll give you an example. Um, I, I love him a lot. Um, the, the black tech guy. I can't think of his name. Is it Marcus and, Brownlee? Yes, Marcus. He just did a video earlier this year talking about race. Like he just did a video talking about race. Your white folks said, girl, turn it off. They was like, girl. We came for you to talk about the new Apple device. We did not come to talk about, we don't see race. We don't see color. And mm. he is, and that's how they think. That's how a lot of black people think. They kind of just assimilate with whiteness. Yeah, um, the ones who are trying to like, the ones who are trying to get, get to some, that level. Right, and, he's and you, always, can, you can, you, you can, you can kind of see that they recognize that um, that isn't the best practice. Like now you can see because they're struggling to talk about things. Like they're struggling, <laughs> like it's in your face now. Versus when I was doing it, it was like, YouTube was like, uh-uh, girl, we ain't talking about this. It's not, we're not promoting this video. <laughs> we, we, you better be lucky we even give you advertising. So they're very against that. So when we saw more protests and more conversations about racism, systematic oppression, all these things, it was just like the folks who've been talking about it start to gain traction. Mm -hmm. And the folks who only were sticking with, you know, pop culture and trying to like, I just want to be positive. I don't want to talk about these things. I'm not a Fox, whatever you, Fox positive person. Like I don't, I deal in real shit. So I don't, I'm not out here giving y'all moon crystals and all these other things and just saying, <laughs> girl, everything's going to be okay if you just smile. I'm just not like, smile mama. Like I'm not one of those people. Like mm -hmm. I'm very, like we can have our moments but still understand like what is going on around and the world around us. Like we can't be speaking our heads in the sand. But it's been interesting to see it play out um, over the last couple of years. You are the underdog, Justin. <laughs> you were the underdog. I, would, I remember when all of the other black YouTubers were really coming at you. Like it was so many at one point. I was like, oh, it's done. It's over. I, <laughs> I, said, I said, one of my faves about to go under, honey. Oh, no. <laughs> 
But then, like a phoenix, bitch, you rise, okay? <laughs> and now here you are, and you are, like I said, you really helped. There's so many different people who I talk to, a lot of black queer folk who watches your videos. So you mm-hmm. really like kind of paved that way for a lot of us who are doing what we're doing now. And I definitely commend you. Mm-hmm. And I always say that Justin Jay has always been one of my uh, inspirations because even through adversity, you came mm-hmm. through. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was some work. It was some work. It's kind of still hard to believe uh, with all the stuff that's going on, but uh, sometimes, sometimes I love it. And sometimes it is stressful. Like there's yeah, some definitely. Things, there's some things like I can take like, Folks I don't know being like like fat phobic and saying all these, but when someone is close to me or we're in my circle, immediate circle, like say some stuff or kind of embolden some things that folks are, it hurts a different type of level. Right. Like, and that was some work like going through that. Like, I was like, girl, what is going on? Like, what is the tea? I mean, like, this ain't it. But I think people are starting to now realize like, I think that Justin is the most like genuine person uh, at all because out of all the things that I've been through, I've been I've been very very honest. There are some things that um, like I've been told you shouldn't you shouldn't tell nobody that you're living with HIV. You shouldn't tell nobody that you like. I had no problem sharing those uh, like those parts of my life. I and mean, some of my folks who helped me get to get here, like maintaining the brand and everything, was like, I don't know if it's their business. I said it's not necessarily about me. It's about like opening the door for conversations around, because I know a lot of folks were looking for me for these conversations, but for me to now like be a part of this identity, like as a person living with HIV and have these conversations, now it's just like, oh, like I I am too living with HIV or I have, like I have a, my partner is or such and such. So it's just like breaking that barrier of what you think HIV looks like. Right. Now let's get into Twitter. <laughs> so well, my, my favorite pants. Um girls, I'm getting sick of Twitter, but she's cute sometimes. <laughs> you know what? I'll say definitely Twitter has been a place where I have I have agreed with you so much on Twitter. Every single thing that you have talked about as far as like fat phobia, as far as the stigma of HIV and AIDS, like you have done mm-hmm some great work. It it could tell that you have really educated yourself and really surrounded yourself with people who, um, who have these conversations and who are very much educated with these conversations. Like through you, I found Deshaun who I Mm. absolutely love. And I'm like, (laughs) I really hope one day that they start like a a podcast or like (laughs) something. Because Deshaun be so, Deshaun is so busy that I was like, girl, you could, but would you have time to, right. to do one? Because even it's a struggle with us doing in the middle because we all be having things going on. Yes, love in the middle, such a great yes. show as well. Uh, so let's talk about fat phobia on Twitter mm-hmm. because I feel like those are the tweets that really got you into into Twitter trouble. Um, and it's been so, it and it really opened my eyes through the conversations that you've been having. It opened my eyes to how fat phobic it is within the black queer community because I mm-hmm. could not I could not believe how many people really thought that you know particularly with Lizzo because I think this is where the root of it really really Oh started. yes. Oh yeah. I cannot believe how many people are out here thinking that their 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 trash ass thoughts is okay. Like isn't it even shocking with one of your faves be out here saying the stuff too? I can I was like, what the fuck are you, what is going on? (laughs) And the amount of people I had to block, (laughs) I was like, oh no, I can't deal. And the fact that every single time you tweet something in regards to fat phobia, it like, it goes viral. And then people come up with the same old trash ass opinions over and over again. (laughs) So how do you- Oh girl, they let us say that I'm unhappy. (laughs) Right. And I'm just sitting here like, I guess I'm unhappy too, because I feel the same way. I mean, but that's, I mean, that's what they do. But fat phobia on Twitter is, I mean, it, it, it's like it exists in real life too. I think we yeah. just, I think people are way more comfortable being out loud with it on Twitter. Um, because like, there's no kind of, there's no consequences behind it too much. Right. Like it's not, you can't, you can be fat phobic and not get suspended on Twitter. Can't say anything like trash about someone living with HIV. Um, and you can, you can say that on Twitter and, and you'll get, you'll get, suspended like mm-hmm. i've had someone get suspended for saying something about that but um 
But there's no protection for like for fat folks, especially online. Um, and all the folks I follow always talk about it. And imagine trying to have a conversation about something that somebody does not want to have a conversation about, or it doesn't hold any weight because, you know, well, girl, like just lose weight, like just lose weight, like you like you are miserable because you are fat. That's like no, I'm not miserable. That's the misconception that you think I am. And all the media helps support that. Like all the movies that we've seen, all of the stories we've seen of right, those, right. Um, oh, they're not happy until they're losing weight or they, or whatever. Like it's just, it is, it, it is a mess. Now, we miss Twitter. <laughs> I, there is not, I don't even be wanting to like go viral. I just literally just, just tweet and say, hey, you know, it is, you know, it is fat phobic to not want to be fat. And instead of like, interrogating that instead of like what like reading they was like no no like they this can't be they started to melt like right then and then right like, yeah no it's no it's, it can't be it can't be it just can't be i was just like but it is and i feel bad sometimes even having these like conversations because then these folks go to deshaun about it who is my close friend and I'm like, girl, I ain't even trying to like put you in there. Like when I be having conversations about my like my own experiences, I don't want you to feel like that you had to come in and and um, protect me or any other thing. And I don't even be wanting to it to go viral. I just be wanting to just have a conversation about it. So the pushback is, oh my gosh, it. Sometimes I'm just like, maybe if I just don't talk about it no more, I'll be okay. I'm just like I know there's a good amount of like black, you know, I'm not even gonna call them queer. I'm just gonna call them uh, <laughs> black gay men on Twitter, who um who are fat phobic and they haven't realized that and they they try to explain their reason for not liking me, but they it just ends, ends up being fat phobic. <laughs> like all the time, it's never well. He's angry, and I was like, no, girl, I'm just like passionate about the things I'm having the conversation. It's no different than y'all being passionate about Cardi B, um, getting a Grammy or stuff. It's no different than y'all being passionate about Nicki Minaj eating somebody up on a bird. It's the same thing, but this mm -hmm. stuff affects real folks, like yeah. in real life. So I'm very passionate about it. So I'm not angry, but I think they automatically apply that to me because I am fat and I am dark skin, so they automatically assume that. And that I'm always, no matter how, how successful I am or no whatever, Things that are barriers that I break or do anything, I'm right. always going to be unhappy, unhappy because I am fat. It's the same thing they did to Adele. Yes, it's it's it's, it's the same thing. Like Adele could have been happy throughout her whole relationship, her whole marriage while she was fat, but now since she's lost weight, she's happy. This and that, like she got divorced, she might be going through like depression right now right um, from the divorce and that might have caused her to lose weight because she but we don't apply that to we automatically think since a person has become thin that they all they're already happy like oh girl she's happy now but it's just like yeah yes, people, it could be completely different people always view weight loss as like a solution to happiness mm -hmm. but it's not because a lot of the times when you see people lose weight it's because sometimes it's from tra trauma like it's just mm -hmm. coming from a traumatic place so them losing weight is not solving the problem because they're still going to have to unpack that and still have to deal mm -hmm. with that trauma after all that weight is gone. And I can tell you and right imagine, now, as a I fat person, I, I'm pretty satisfied with my life. A lot of my issues don't root for me being fat. It comes from other mm -hmm. shit, but it ain't coming from me being fat. <laughs> Period. And just uh, imagine what it is like to, you know, lose this weight because you are depressed and then you gain the weight and folks be like, oh, girl, what happened? It was like, I'm happy now. Oh, no, you're not, girl. You're still. It was like, I'm happy. Like, you were happy for me when I was seeing it, but I was depressed. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's, it's, of course, we shouldn't be talking about folks like, like um, weight or any of things, like right, even right. beyond um, the conversation, like what happened with, um, with Chadwick. Yes. Like, people, people made jokes. Um, I, it, it was, the jokes were so bad that I thought that he had lost weight for a role. Mm -hmm. I thought he had lost weight because the conversation was like, oh, he's playing a role. That's why he lost weight. And I bought into that and I made a joke on my live stream about it. And when like when it happened, I was like, I felt bad because 
people were clowning it so bad that I began to think that I started to believe what they were saying. Mm-hmm. Like I, like I, I, I felt, I feel really bad for him coming online and having to deal with that. And it's just like, can we just let people? Can we just leave people alone about this? Can we just like not like do that? Can we just not clap for somebody when they lose weight? Clap for folks or be concerned with folks? Can we just not do any of that? Can we just not? Can you just worry about a person's mental health no matter what way they are at? Yes. Or, like, or just let them talk to you and tell you something. If they don't tell you something, then don't assume something is wrong with something that's perfect. That's how I feel because whenever I see folk talk about, oh my God, you look so good because uh, you lost weight to other people. Oh, you lost mm-hmm. weight. To, oh, you look good. Oh, you must be happy or you're great. I'm just like, you don't know what's going on in that person's life. You don't know if they're working out to deal with stress. Mm-hmm. Like, you don't know if they are they're losing all this weight because of stress or because of some trauma or if they or whatever's going on in their house so you just can't assume things so that's why whenever i see people lose weight i i, I don't comment i don't really i don't say anything i look at it i'm like okay and then i keep it pushing because it, it shouldn't be something that we're commenting on we need to get out the habit of commenting on people's physical appearance and mm-hmm. really worry about how are you doing how's your day going you, you know what mm-hmm. i mean so yeah, yeah and I, I think it's i think it's important I and mean, I, i've i've um it, it, it's so much like I think that's one of the things that um like fat folks deal with when they go home for like Thanksgiving or anything oh. like I had to gather my grandma about that because I remember she made a comment out and she was just like hey how much you I was like don't ask me no damn shit like that like she literally asked me this was like three years ago like I oh like you gained so much like weight or how much you weigh now and I'm like, you want to die, no matter what, hang out with your ass. Like, you might want to talk to you in two right. years. I don't want to every time, girl, I already got to deal with you and your, and your uh, beliefs and your Christianity and shit. But damn, I got to come in here and I got to deal with you berating me, asking me how much weight I done gained or what's this and that. And it's just like, why is that so important to you? Are you asking this to everybody or are you just only asking it to me? Right. And are you asking because you want me to stop gaining weight? Mm-hmm. So... That's one of the things I've seen is just like folks don't feel comfortable going home for these reasons. And I have to say my family, like every time I come here, I don't feel like having a conversation about like my weight or whatever. Like oh. I'm just I home is supposed to, to be that. a place of, of relaxation. It's supposed to be a place mm-hmm. where you're separating yourself from the world because you're at home, mm-hmm. you're at peace. But then when you're at home, people be asking you about your sexuality, be asking about what's going on in your life, and you're just like I'm here. Can we have a conversation about something else? <laughs> no, we cannot. We have to talk about your body because this is disgusting. We right. Look at this. <laughs> You're not going to get a second play of them, of them collard greens and mac and cheese. Uh, you need to slow down. Know, listen, if I can't get them here, <laughs> I just go get them from Uber Eats or something or Postmates or something because I'm going to get myself. I think folks need to, I think people really need to like do better with that because a lot of folks be like struggling when they come home. And I'm not one of those folks that I'm going to hold my tongue. I don't hold my tongue for my parents. Oh, hell no. I don't hold my tongue for anybody. Like, I'm going to just let them know, like, hey, you're going to either stop this or we're just not going to be cool. <laughs> and that's it. And that's like, what it boils down to. <laughs> yeah, if you don't, if because I need to protect my peace. And I don't care if that is me cutting off talking to my grandmother, my cousin, auntie, or anything. I'm going to protect my peace. Like, you're not going to force me to be in any type of post environment that i don't feel comfortable in right right yes i think that's what it really boils down to is just leave people alone <laughs> leave people alone stay Please. out of their business stop worrying Please. about what's going on physically stop worrying about what's going on in their wallets i had to <laughs> when i tell you i just had to eat somebody the fuck up yesterday for that nonsense and i'm just like just mind your business worry about what you're doing worry about your body Worry about what's going on in your pockets. Worry about what's going on over there. Stop worrying about this other shit. If you're not going to ask me, like, how are you doing? Where's your, how's your mental health going? Like, mm-hmm. if you're not going to ask me that shit, don't talk to me. Because like, at this point, it's just, not, it's just nonsense. It's nonsense. So, yeah, just leave people the fuck alone. And that's, and that's my message. Okay. It's very hard for folks to do that, though. <laughs> but we, we hope maybe one day they'll be able to grasp it. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. So... I just have one more question before we get up mm-hmm. out of here. And, and then I want to share my last thoughts. Um, okay, well, you're fine. Uh, so what does the future look like for the King of Reeds? Where do you see yourself in the next couple of years? 
I honestly don't even know. Like, mm. um, where I would like to be, I think I would like to um, get to the point where I am putting more creators on ahead of me, like mm. like pushing other folks and helping them get to where they want to be at. Um, Cause I know, I wonder eventually like, how long I'm gonna keep doing this. And right, like, right. do I want to go like take a background approach and just like help folks out? Um, because it is, it is very taxing. It is, it is, I will not lie. I think this year is the most times I've taken since like social media break ever. Yeah. yeah. Like I've never, like, I was like, oh my God. I was just like, no, I got to fight. I got to fight. And I was like, Justin, you are 33 years old. You cannot be on this motherfucker arguing with these <laughs> folks like this. Like there, there just be so much unnecessary stuff. Like just even responding to subtweets and shit, like. Uh, it's just so much shit I can talk about, but this is like, leave me alone, sis. Just let me live. So I think in the next couple of years, I think I would like to get to the point where I'm putting more creators in front of me, helping them get to where they want to be at, and um, kind of like just freshen up and um, clean up the brand. I yeah. would like to do like more things. I would like I would like to get back to podcasting. But the world has changed so much. Yes, your podcast was amazing. Yes, Mother Culture Podcast was. If she was, if Mother Culture Podcast was still going, she would be eating the girls up right it, now. It would have. It would have. <laughs> it would have, <laughs> girl. I, uh, when that I podcast went <laughs> defunct, I was pissed, okay? I was I, like, shit. A lot of people were hurt, and I really tried to like, like hold it because I knew it was something special to a lot of folks. Yeah, yeah. But it, it, but it came to like starting to erode my mental health. It was just like, I, like, I'm doing this for everybody else, but it was just like, there was so much drama. It was just so much unnecessary drama. that I was just like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> like, I, I can't do this anymore. Um, yeah. But I really do believe, I tell folks like, for the culture podcast was like any other podcast. like. We were tackling some real shit. We were not out here giving no bullshit ass pop culture shit. We was out here diving into real issues that we yes. were learning together. And it was so interesting because the dynamic of you two were good was great. But mm-hmm. also it was, it was two people who you could tell did their homework. These are two yes. people who were on here not kissing these celebrities' asses. <laughs> like when I listened to And had a real friendship. Too. And had a real friendship. I was listening, you know, one of my favorite podcasts to read. This is no shade, y'all. No shade. <laughs> we love the read. <laughs> I love the read so much. But sometimes I feel like, damn, they're not going in on this person the way I really feel like they need to be going in on this individual. You know, like... But- oh, yeah. I think one of them for me is when the Charlemagne situation happened. And um, I think somebody asked Crystal, like, hey, girl, like, you gonna call this out? And she was like, y'all don't tell me what to talk about and all that. And I do understand what she says with that, but... Any other person, you would be ready to eat their ass up. So that's the what, reason that's why you're, it's, it, yeah. it's the inconsistency. Because had it been anybody else, you would have ate their ass up. So don't say, don't give me no topics and stuff when you don't do that any other time. But it's the closer, like the, the bigger you become, it is fair hard. It's one of the things that I struggle with sometimes too. And I, the reason why I don't kind of want to be mainstream because I don't want any like my connections and stuff with celebrity to keep me from you know, being honest, because there are surprisingly a number of celebrities and folks who do watch me and they don't say shit. Like, uh-huh. and they have told me like, girl, I watch you, but bitch, you done ate me up so fast. <laughs> like, I think the last one was with Brandy. Brandy had literally told me, she was like, I love that you just are so honest and you're just so true. Like, you just don't be giving a damn. I was like, I have to, because at the end of the day, my allegiance is to my audience. It's not allegiance to black celebrities. The celebrities don't like, Pay my bills. They're not out no. here watching my content and that. Like it's the hundreds of thousands of folks who are like when I upload a video or write, so they're interesting in reading and watching what I'm saying. So that's who my is like to that to the truth, and they want the honest opinion from me. But yeah. I think also when you're doing this creative work, it is easy to get burnt out. Like especially yeah. when you're trying to like the creativity pay the bills and stuff, you start to like mass produce it, and then you start to lose that creative. Um, like energy and that's why sometimes I take a break and I don't do videos for a minute because I want to marinate in my thoughts I want to think about what I want to do this what I want to do different so I I can see that and that was one of the things that I was 
looking at with the read, I was like, they're doing the TV show, they're doing the episodes, this, they're doing the website. It's like, girl, I know they burnt out. And sometimes you can tell. You can hear that, it. That you, you, you can, can hear it a little bit. Yeah, you can hear it. Because you're that. supposed to love this shit. You're supposed to love it. But when it is your source of income and like you sign a contract, it's just like, oh no, girl, you got to do it. <laughs> oh, that's why they'd be like, that's why they'd be like, fuck it. We're just going to do an episode on mail. And then that's that. We're not even, and I understand it. Cause it's just like, it, they have a, they just be doing episodes on just mail. Sometimes occasionally you could tell when they get burnt out of talking about celebrity culture and the nonsense. So they just like do episodes on mail sometimes, Jeez. or, you know, they might bring a guest on and they do like an interview or whatever, which is cool. I love it. Cause it's like a change of pace and it kind of keeps me interested. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's that's just interesting. It is so frustrating. I don't, I don't listen to podcasts. I don't listen to podcasts anymore. Oh, that's that's what I do for a job, literally. So I'm over here just <laughs> listening to people's shows and shit. Um, but yeah, I, I do like I do love um the show and I do love these creators or whatever, but sometimes I'm just like, y'all, y'all are not except for you and Adrian, of course, like y'all go in. Y'all don't give a fuck who it is, <laughs> y'all are going in, and that's it. It is what it is. <laughs> Um, and I live for that. If we don't get the contract. We don't get the contract. Yeah, don't get, and it's fine, and that's perfectly fine. I wish Brandy will listen to my damn podcast because I chewed her up about B seven, child. I ch- a couple of people did kind of um, have some some thoughts. I'm not a music head like that, so um, and I haven't listened to her album in its entirety. But um, like some folks have had some honest critiques about it. I liked a couple of songs when I was in the what's name. I liked it, but. I'm I'm not a music head like that. Not that tradition of like R and B. Like I'm very weird. I'll be listening to like scores and other shit. So oh that's wow, the stuff I be, yeah, I'll be listening to movie scores and TV show scores and just like that's the type of music I like. That's and what intellect. I'm listening to. Mo- yeah, well, girl, <laughs> all of it is because I, I, honestly, every time I hear a JT's verse on uh, say or say something, I'll be like, God damn, like. <laughs> This just came out and just it was just everywhere. <laughs> so I call that I call that um, being an intellect too because <laughs> girl, like the way she flowed on that that fucking verse was everything. So you know, I ain't gonna say girl, you gotta be an intellect to be able to listen to that, but I listen to all things. I listen to all yeah. things. But that's my main focus of music. But R and B is not my strong point. That's more your Deshaun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. T, T T knows their rap and all of that. But I'm just like, I don't know. (laughs) I wish you, Brandy, if you ever decide to listen to my podcast, child. (laughs) B7. Are you an R&B head? I'm I'm a I'm an R&B head. I'm a pop head. I am I'm into all the popular genres, of course. But I'm also really into like pop music and electronic industrial music. People don't really listen okay, to. Okay, well you up north, so that's to be expected. <laughs> I also love country music too. My mom is from Alabama, so I love country music. Really, I hate country. Yeah, music. I love every country. Every time I listen to country music, I feel like a um a noose gonna be around my neck. Ah, I only listen to black country artists though. <laughs> if that means anything. Okay, yeah. Well, I just anytime I hear that banjo and shit, I just like yeah. Even though a banjo was made by a black person, I think if I'm not mistaken. All uh, every shit was made by a black person. Yeah, I ain't surprised. But, but these white folks, they didn't colonize that shit. So I'm just like, girl, <laughs> I, it's a different area. But yeah, <laughs> music is music is something that I like, but it's not like my expertise. Like I would not do it for an episode, or um, I wouldn't do a show around that. Yeah, but I yeah. know a lot of people who do know their shit, and I'd be very much impressed by it. Yes, I don't know it. Yeah, I'd be into it. I'd be there watching. You know, I'd just be like, okay, child, let me listen to what this artist is giving. Even the ones I don't like, sometimes, you know, I occasionally peek in to see, like, okay, what are they giving on this record? Mm. Um, what do you think about Ariana Grande's new album? The girls say they don't like it that much. My issue with Ariana Grande and... Oh my gosh. Okay, so I have a Ariana Grande poster on my wall cuz I love I do adore her sometimes, you know. This album though was the closest to her trying to be black than ever. And I and I, this is the first time I listened to an Ariana Grande album and I was like, "Oh my god, I am completely uncomfortable." We got a I call it the big black elephant in the room. We got a mm-hmm. little bit of it during Seven Rings last year. Mm-hmm. And it was peaking she and I was like, turn this shit up." On this album, no, sure, Corey. the AAVE, what you waiting for? What you waiting for? She said it on the damn song. I said, huh? 
And she out here making bukus of money from this shit. And I said, and there's a song called My Hair, and it is written by five black folk. Five black people on the writing credits for that song. We know Ariana's hair is a talking point, but five black people wrote that shit for you, and you're talking about your hair? What? It's the black face for me. <laughs> I said, Victoria Monet, keep that shit for yourself and save it for the damn next album, child. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired. See, that's music here because I don't even know who Victoria Monet was until you said something. Yeah, she's the person who, does a, who writes a lot of the songs for... She has a big old black team behind her. So mm-hmm. I can't listen to the album without cringing and feeling uncomfortable. So I said, this is a skip for me. Um, whenever you decide to go back to the more... She's always been making like black adjacent music, if you ask me. Mm-hmm, she does. But when, if it, when it becomes more... I want it to lean more towards the white girl. Stay over there. <laughs> stay, stay over the pop <laughs> shit. <laughs> You know, give us the balance. The, 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 the Katy Perry's, the Miley's, go over there. Don't come over and here. Miley has an uh, um, album that's coming out the next um, couple of weeks on it. Yeah. Girl, y'all love and hate. Y'all love Miley, though. I don't fuck with her like that. I don't either. She scarred me. The Bangers era scarred me. Was that when she was on the Wrecking Ball and shit? Yep. Okay. See, I don't even know. I listen to her. I don't listen to Purdue Chicken. I don't listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I said, if only these black producers and writers could focus on these black artists as much as they do with these white artists. But you know what? They, I think they can. They're just not making any money from it, and the, mm. the labels are not spending no money on these black artists like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, listen, I mean, look at when we do get a black artist or something like Sweetie. <laughs> so, and she's not even an artist. She's not even but from she, the hood. She's not even from the hood. No, she, she's not. She's not. Sweetie is just. I the girls only like Sweetie because she's thin and she's light skinned. That's I swear to God, that's it. She don't have like they, they really call that like having um just that aesthetic alone is enough to be like, oh she's a bad bitch. Like, like it's just it. Like it's just it. Like sis can't she can't rap. I mean, I never heard a verse that I thought like bitch, she wrote that. Like JT, if JT if you took JT shit and put it in Sweetie. Right. It'll be all the way. Because JT right. is it. But like, yeah, I just need to clean that homophobia up and clean up some other stuff and stop putting men on these damn female remixes and shit. <laughs> I oh just my like stop. Gosh. Shit. Stop with it the homophobia, so please. Stop with uh, but Santana, it's your please. That's what look, your fan base. Well, look at Nikki. She don't give a fuck about that shit either. None of these well, girls. She don't either. They don't. I just want one of them. I just want just I just want to have fun, child. Can y'all just make the damn music and just stop fucking talking at this point? Mm-mm, because they still try and get these male appeals and just like, I don't know why y'all had Donald Trump's lackey on this damn remix. Lil Wayne and his two dreads didn't need to be on there. They had a fucking white man up. on that song, child. They, Jack- called him, I, they called him Jack the Sparrow. And I was like, who? <laughs> I still don't know what he look like. I don't know who he is either. And I said, oh, hell no. What is this? I don't even think they even re- JT and them didn't even do their verse. They didn't even redo their verse. I have to go back and listen to it. I have oh. to come back. Pause that. <laughs> right. I didn't even listen to the shit. I I skipped it. It was a skip for me. I don't even. Listen I heard to the joke. snippet for like a minute, a minute, and it was. I think I heard Quavo. No. <laughs> I heard Quavo, Wayne, and somebody else, and I was just like this shit is trash. I don't. I haven't even heard the version with Doja Cat. I don't even listen to Doja Cat. Oh, that's just cute. I like it. Hold on. We t- I went to- what's somebody talking about with the two girls in Doja Cat? You talking about Pussy Talk? They did some with her with Pussy Talk. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't heard that song either. So I don't. I don't know what the hell's going on. I heard. Oh, I know God. Doja Cat's first album. That's it. Because I was in college, and college kids love Doja. So, mm-hmm. but I do. haven't heard. I haven't heard shit else. I haven't heard this new album. I didn't. I heard the remix with um Nikki and I said, Oh hell no. The bisexual line made me you turn didn't it like? off. Maybe turn it off. Who said something? Nikki said something about being um, bisexual last time? Once I was bi, now I'm just hetero. And I said, Oh, okay, off. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki, yeah, that's why I'll be dragging her ass every two weeks and motherfucker show be pressed about it. But <sighs> ain't talking about bag, I don't want to hear it, but that's that's Nikki for you. She's gonna bring you something that's 
problematic. I said, damn, girl, I fucking loved you, too. Like, Roman Reloaded was my shit. Like, no. I think Chris, I think um, Roman Reloaded in the second album was my favorite. I think Roman Reloaded came out when I was in overseas. I was in eighth grade. <laughs> shit, I was on that motherfucker um, being a, um, a war criminal. So, oh. <laughs> yeah, like, I was, I was in Iraq when uh, Roman Reloaded came out. Good job. I know. History. But I enjoyed this. Like, yes. This. this was fun. I'm happy you did enjoy it. So, okay, the last thoughts. Everybody, stay the fuck home, okay? At the point, at the time that this episode is recorded, I'm pretty sure it's going to go up sometime in January or February. Um, regardless, we're still going to be in this situation. Stay the fuck home. Oh, I agree, though. Stay I just home. had a conversation. I just had a conversation with somebody about like, should Wonder Woman come out um, on the video on demand, or should it be released in the cinema? I was like, it needs to be released on um, like online because I don't see anybody rushing to no movie theater even next summer. No. If we see more, if we see another three hundred, four hundred thousand people die from this shit, a lot of folks are going to be scarred. Like it's going to either like. Jeremiah is in the hospital right now. He's on a I see you. Like yes. Like it's getting if we're gonna start seeing more of that, like more people like that we know of or somebody in our circle who are going to be affected by COVID or yeah. like die from it. So it's going to be a lot of us are going to be scarred from this. We're seeing almost two hundred thousand cases a day. A day. And it's crazy because now we're coming off the backs of Halloween. You know, so everybody was out during Halloween. I wasn't. I was inside the house with my wine. I was too. It was. I was. Matter of fact, I'm gonna go get some wine in a minute. Then you got Thanksgiving. Yeah. Then you got Christmas yep. and New Year's. The biggest holidays, and during a flu season, mind you. And I never had never two and two never came together for me until recently. And I was like, damn, this is flu season, and we have all these yeah. major fucking holidays, and now we got COVID. So it's it's really it's really really bad. So everybody, please stay the fuck in your house, um, friends. I'm so sorry. I'm not going to be visiting you, and that's just that. Like I got my test recently, and I'm all good. But even if you get tested, you still have to wait, and that's not no. So stay the fuck inside. Even when you're listening to this, stay home and wear your mask or fuck that. Wear a fucking face shield at this point, child. <laughs> <laughs> we're both. <laughs> oh, we're both. And some shades too. Cause <laughs> thank Wear you. So- <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Justin, aka the King of Reads, for coming on to the Devon Hour podcast. This was great. I'm going I'm so happy to I'm gonna have a good time editing this fucking podcast. Oh,